Okay, so in this section, we're going to be looking at EMGs, which are just stands for electromyograms. So we've already looked at uh, excitable cells of the body, um, particularly in the nervous system. We've looked at some muscle tissue specifically. Now we're kind of looking at the connection between the two and how that communication uh, carries out. Okay, so for the first part of what we're describing here, we want to look at how uh, muscles and EMG analysis work. So first off, we have to take a look at uh, and define what a motor unit is. So remember, a motor unit is defined as the single motor neuron and all the muscle fibers it innervates. So the output that we receive to our muscles, the, the body doesn't really think of it in individual muscle fibers. It thinks of it more as a motor unit. So when this single motor neuron is excited, all of the muscle fibers within its unit will be uh, stimulated or excited to contract. So the motor output, like we said, um, has to do with how many motor units are being recruited. So the, the motor unit, let's say in this case we have neuron, motor neuron 1. Let's go back a step here. Get out our pin. So we have motor unit 1, we have motor unit 2, and motor unit 3. right? So each of those controls or excites their own set of muscle fibers. And only when that motor unit is excited will those muscle fibers contract. So you can think of it as a, a more of an efficiency system. So when we are contracting a particular muscle, um, if it's a very light load, we don't need to we don't need to excite every single motor unit within that muscle because that would be inefficient and unnecessary. So we have this ability to sort of recruit um, based on what's needed. So the forced output in the end has to do with um, how much a load has to be overcome and then that will correspond to how many motor units are recruited. So if I have a very low load, right, then I only have to recruit maybe one motor unit in order to overcome it. If I have a much higher load, so I need more force, so more force is required, I will recruit not only motor unit one, but maybe motor unit two, and then uh, the sum total of those together will give me a much greater force output than, than each of those uh, individually. So, <clears throat> the relative size of a motor unit will vary depending on the muscle and its functional use. So some of this has to do with how the person actually uses it or how it's been trained um, or what particular anatomical structure it's actually innervating. Um, so this will determine what's called its innervation ratio. So this is the number of muscle fibers innervated by a single motor neuron. Typically, <clears throat> the larger the motor unit, the higher the innervation ratio, meaning the more muscle fibers that it innervates per motor neuron, the higher that ratio will be. So muscles that control very fine motor movements, such as eye movements, right? Um, or uh, muscles of the fingers or muscles of the face, right? These are gonna require uh, very fine motor control, and these will typically have much fewer muscle fibers per motor neuron. Okay, so we can have that, that better uh, motor coordination and control. Whereas muscles that typically are used for very gross movements, strength and power, they have a very high number of muscle fibers per motor neuron. Okay, so fine motor control units may have less than maybe 100 fibers per, per unit, whereas large, stronger units, uh, like those of the thigh or the glutes, may have thousands of fibers per unit. So it just depends on what they're used for. So the physiology of an increasing motor unit goes by a number of principles, but really the, the going one in most of your textbooks is what's called the Henneman size principle. So what it says is that the physiological method of recruiting motor units is typically from the smallest motor unit to the largest motor unit. Now there are situations where large motor units may be able to be recruited first prior to some of the smaller ones, 
um, sometimes at the onset of very highly explosive activities, like if you're running with a football and you have to cut, stop and cut real fast, um, that may be a situation where they've measured some larger motor units may be recruited first. But the greater one trains the nervous system. So this is what the conditioning process is all about when you're training for a sport or, or for a particular skill. Um, the nervous system will be better, better be able to recruit these uh, for very future similar uh, activities. Now, as we begin to recruit more motor units and larger motor units, right, at a point where, and this depends on the motor unit too, or the muscle that we're, we're recruiting, um, at about 50% of the maximum, uh, we may actually start to increase what's called rate coding, where these motor units are being stimulated, but now they're being stimulated more frequently before we start recruiting some of the bigger motor units. So this is another way to match load or match demand with force output per unit. So at some point, and depending on the muscle, um, right around 50% of its maximum force output, we start to see this rate coding slip in. Um, but some muscles require about 90% of its maximal force before it starts increasing um, the rate coding aspect of increasing muscle force. So an electromyogram is, is not typically a measurement of voltage from a single motor unit, although, uh, depending on the sensitivity of the equipment, if you're doing like a needle EMG, like a, a neurologist might do, or a physical medicine and rehabilitation physician, something of that nature, they may be able to get closer to that level. Uh, a gross EMG, which is something that we'll be doing in our lab, where we're using uh, electrodes and these are measurements of the electrical potentials as measured at the skin surface. So these are really a sum total of all the motor units being recruited. Um, so it's not individual action potentials because as you can see here, um, the larger the bar, right, that's the larger the sum total, whereas here we have a much smaller sum total. So sum total meaning the, the total amount of voltage being received at that muscle, right? And we can sort of uh, concur that more motor units are being recruited if we're getting a much larger sum total output. And this says that as the force required to overcome some load is imposed upon a muscle, we increase the motor units demanded in order to meet that demand. So here's a nice EMG analysis. This actually was done in the thumb. So what we're looking at here is flexion and extension of the thumb itself at approximately, you know, there's about a 25 to 50 degree range of motion. You can really look at this, this, this is a graph of the thumb, but you can look at this as the elbow too because the same concept works and it's a little easier to, to understand. So <clears throat> when I'm in full extension of the elbow, right, my arm is completely extended. Whereas when I'm in flexion of the elbow, right, the angle has changed quite a bit. Whereas the angle is greater here um, if I'm in full extension. So let's say I'm in full extension here, right? We can see that the muscles that are required to extend the elbow, the triceps, are being stimulated, right? And in order to do that, I have to keep the biceps quiet. So I would see very little to no activity. Now there's always some, uh, and there may be some co-contraction. So you may see some fibers here when you're doing, or some um, EMG analysis of the biceps versus the triceps and yours because we always have some co-contraction and that's necessary to stabilize a joint. If we have complete flaccidity of one muscle and complete contraction of another, that could actually facilitate um, disruption of the joint itself. Now when I'm flexing, let's say the elbow, right, the triceps are turned off, right, but the biceps would be turned on. Okay, so this is indicating a flexion of the, the joint itself. 
So I'm I'm recruiting more motor units in the in the biceps or the muscles that are required to flex the elbow, and I'm quieting the ones in the triceps. And this is basically because our muscles and our joints um, are situated in antagonistic pairs. So my bicep muscle will not push the elbow into extension. It can only pull on that joint, whereas the triceps can only pull the elbow from the backside into extension versus uh, it can't push into flexion. So we have these alternating recruitment of motor units on opposite sides of the joint in order to get the motion that's necessary. Okay, So in your lab, you're going to see something very similar to this. When you're trying to recruit the biceps and quiet the triceps or recruit the triceps and, and um, or recruit the triceps and quiet the biceps. So either way, uh, you're going to get some opposite um, indicators and in some in the EMG analysis that you'll see. Okay.